Follow us on Instagram, at ScoreNorthMN as well. We uh, pump out content there. We're obviously on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for everyone who has uh, been following us. We've been hitting some new benchmark highs over the last month, especially with the draft, and a really, really big appreciation to you guys for making all of that happen. Uh, Vikings event line tonight. We're going to be talking with Garrett. We're going to be a projection of win totals. We're going to talk maybe uh, what position groups are still concerning the most, and should the Vikings sign a wide receiver or cornerback. But before I bring Garrett on the screen, obviously, if you want to join a future episode of Vikings Ventline, shoot me an email, vikingsventline at gmail.com. And in fact, because Garrett's going to be my only guest this evening, if you'd like to get in on tonight's show, this is going to be an impromptu event line. I usually don't do this, but if you want to get in on tonight's show, we'll see how good this executive producer skills are. Shoot me an email, vikingsventline at gmail.com, and we'll see if I can bring you on the screen with me and Garrett, and we'll break down some uh, Minnesota Vikings topics. And maybe the offseason. I know OTAs are uh, still a few, are just, just basically, rookie minicamps wrapped up, OTAs around the corner, training camp later this summer. We're in that little awkward offseason of the NFL, but football never sleeps. Football's still supreme, especially when the Minnesota Wild can't find, find out how to score a goal. And the Minnesota Twins, although they win a series for once, uh, aren't really that interesting. So at that point, we still talk Vikings football. So if you want to get on, on this show or a future episode of Vikings Ventline, shoot me an email, vikingsventline at gmail.com. All right, let's bring on Garrett. My buddy Garrett here, he's down in Burnsville. He was just talking to me off the mic. He's got tickets uh, to the Seattle Seahawks game. Finally, Garrett, there's a Seahawks home game, a Vikings home game against Seattle. They're actually not going to Seattle for once in their franchise history. I know, right? It's, it's a bit weird. I think it's what the last game was 2015 here. Every year yeah. since it's at Seattle, it's, what can you do? I know, man. Not convert on fourth and short. <laughs> fourth and two. All you had to do was just get two yards, Alex Madison, and for whatever reason, just because that's one life, job. life of Vikings fan, uh, you weren't able to do that. So, uh, Garrett, you're, you're a lifelong Vikings fan. You are telling me your grandpa remembers uh, the Super Bowls. Maybe sometimes he doesn't remember all the Super Bowls because you were telling me that uh, he was having maybe a couple Corona hard seltzers back in the Dizay. Maybe not Corona uh, hard seltzers, but uh, some adult beverages. And those adult, Super Bowl, yes. those uh, 70 Super Bowl <laughs> losses. But you and I have probably seen our fair share of NFC championship game losses. So before we get into the questions, what is your uh, earliest memory as a Vikings fan? Earliest memory, I'm going to have to go that 9 championship game loss when Favre threw across his body. Come on, man, this isn't Detroit. This is the Super Bowl, as Paul Allen, Paul Allen would say. Yep. That's probably my earliest one, to be honest. I was about to say, mine usually mine was uh, the 2000 NFC, 41 donut, the, and mm. the week before. So that wasn't my first football memory, but I remember the week before, the Vikings beat the Saints at home in the divisional round, Aaron Brooks and the New Orleans Saints. And that was my first Vikings memory. And then the very next week getting slaughtered, uh, 41 Donut in New York. And that began a very uh, string of heartbreaking Vikings moments and losses. So that was eight-year-old Declan, and, and now I'm, I'm still entrenched as being a Vikings fan. I'm still not giving up, still not giving up hope at all. So I feel you, man. You and I, like, and other people that are Vikings fans, deserve a level of a medal of honor for what we've had to endure oh, in absolutely. our franchise. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Either a medal of honor or at least a purple heart from all the scars. Right. All right, let's uh, we'll, we'll kick off this first question here, Garrett. I, I, I sent you some prep notes here, and I wanted to know, because Judd and I kicked this around on Friday's episode of Purple Daily, which you can also find on Apple, Spotify, and right here on YouTube as well on our channel. Um, should the Vikings prioritize signing a wide receiver or a cornerback with their remaining free agency money? So th they still have a little bit more money to play with here after their rookie draft class. I think the Kyle Rudolph post-designated June 1st will create up a little bit more space. What do you think? Should the Vikings maybe grab one more cornerback with, uh, to put some solidifyingness on that defense, or would you rather see them maybe get a veteran third wide receiver? Because even though Jefferson and Thielen are studs, oof, it's, it's pretty much open competition for that third spot. No, I, um, I'm of the opinion, uh, excuse me, sorry, get a cornerback. You know, Dantzler got hurt, what was it, three separate times last year? He got a little bit, little bit better with each game, but he got hurt a lot. You know, sign a veteran corner. That way, if Dantzler or I'm sorry, Peterson gets hurt because he's getting up there too. Yeah, you're not, you know, out of luck, out of nowhere. So I'm leaning towards cornerback, but I could also see them trying to get in a third wide receiver. Are you are you in on the idea of Larry Fitzgerald Jr. coming back home to the Vikings, or or, or is he basically at this point pretty much cooked in his career and probably wouldn't make that much of a difference on the field at the, at be with him being so far up there in age? I think he's cooked on the field, but I think he'd be a really good locker room president or presence for you know a really young wide receiver core other than Thielen. 
So I think he'd be good for the locker room, but not good for the field, if that makes sense. No, I got you on that. Yeah, I, it'd be a great storyline. And like you said, probably be a really cool dude in the locker room. Justin Jefferson would obviously benefit from that as well. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of would rather just, I, I'm not a Chad Beebe guy, as long as our podcast audience knows well, but I would rather just uh, give that opportunity to someone younger and probably who can make a more of an impact on the field. The Vikings did have some interest. This is from our friend Darren Doogie Wolfson and cornerback Bashad Breeland of the Kansas City Chiefs. He apparently was here last week for a visit. The Vikings made an offer, according to Doogie. Uh, Breeland, a believe like a six, seven year pro, has played in a couple Super Bowls with the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, kind of the guy you're looking for, and honestly, someone that Mike Zimmer would love to get his hands on, just like you were saying, Garrett. Like, if, if you'd rather have depth on the cornerback side, because if Pat Peterson goes down, and even though Cam Dantzler had a, who had a very good rookie year, also missed some time, I would bet that he would rather have a cornerback here than try to get a wide receiver. No, I'm absolutely with you there. I think you know you can get him on a one year, maybe a two year deal if you talk him into it, with maybe what one two mil with some incentives. Yeah. Yeah, he made a million and a half last season with Kansas City, so he's probably going to be getting a, a veteran minimum type deal, you know. Right. So I, I wouldn't, I can't really see a scenario where they overpay for him. And to be honest, it would probably be a, um, it probably be a, a good situation for him. Let's go to this next uh, topic. Judd and I were talking about this also this weekend on Purple Daily, and it's what position group concerns you the most with this year's Vikings. So, you know, the, the Vikings credit them; they got Christian Derrissaw, they got Wyatt Davis. The offensive line should be better. But I feel like also, and Judd pointed out, that we're also sleeping on the idea that, hey, just because they got two better guys doesn't mean it's obviously naturally fixed and you feel super, super comfortable going into a season with it. At the same time, you and I just brought up cornerback and wide receiver. There's obviously still a little bit of lacking depth there. What position group for you uh, concerns you the most with the Vikings? I'm going to have to go center, honestly. Because Bradbury, year three, looking more like a bust, not his fault. Well, yeah. I mean, it kind of is his fault. You, you see pictures of him. I saw this on Facebook the other day. He was in the Twins bullpen for some reason. He just – he didn't look like a center. You think center, you think meat and potatoes. Right. He was – he looked very uh, small compared yeah. to the baseball players in there at least. He He's a – you know, they drafted him as an athletic center, right? Like they drafted him as this like guy who does the zone blocking scheme and maybe not the biggest, baddest guy. Like Christian Derrissaw is a left tackle, and you can tell that dude plays left tackle – in the NFL, uh, where Greg Bradbury kind of looks more like a guard, and he's smaller, and he's stocky. I'm not trying to undersell that he's obviously a National Football League player. You deserve credit for that. But I know what you mean. I mean, this is make or break for Garrett Bradbury. Uh, I mean, he had a pretty underwhelming rookie season last year. I don't think he necessarily took a step back, but not really a significant step forward either. Like, he'll be playing for that fifth-year option. Excuse me. Uh, you're good. Fifth-year option going into this season. If he, They need him. They absolutely need him to be a better center to help protect Kirk. No, absolutely. And Kirk's one of those guys. He needs a good, if not great, O-line. Yep. He needs time to step back and throw. He's not going to escape pressure. We've seen that for three years now. He's just not going to escape pressure. How do you feel about safety after Harrison Smith? You know, I know they have Xavier Woods in here. They brought him free agency. And Harrison Smith's still a damn good, as far as my indication are, is still a damn good safety. Maybe not at his prime that he was, you know, four or five years back, but he's still one of the better safeties in the league. How do you feel about the safety position for the Vikings going to 2021? I'm nervous about it. It's not my chief concern, but there's it's on the list, definitely, a top five. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, Harrison's still one of the best in the league. Is he a bit slower? Yes, but he also has just that football IQ of he knows where to be and where when to be there. So, you know, he signed Xavier Woods, was he from the Cowboys? I don't Correct. remember his deal exactly. I was looking over his stats, and he's competent. He's good. Not Harrison Smith good or Anthony Harris two years ago good, but he's all right. Yeah. If one of them goes down, I think uh, I think we got some trouble on our hands. No, absolutely. That that's what I, that's what concerns me. Um, you know, Xavier Woods, yeah, should be a nice plug and play safety. He basically fills Anthony Harris's spot on the free side, but. Um, if Harrison Smith, who's kind of like that ball hawk and the captain of that defense, at least in the secondary side, those young corners need good safety help over the top. And if Harrison Smith were to go down, or yeah, if they lost Xavier Woods even, I mean, ooh, you, you're basically, you might have to sign someone off the street basically to help fill that need. And I, that does concern me. And, and, you know, I told Judd to linebacker to a little bit. And I don't think it's really a concern. It's just like an unknown to me. Like every year we always say, well, Anthony Barr now is back and healthy and he should be good and he'll rush the quarterback, but then he doesn't rush the quarterback. You know, Eric Hendricks is still a, one of the best linebackers in the league, but you also lost Eric Wilson. 
you know, um, linebacker in general, I think the position group kind of does a little bit of concerning concerns for me as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, I don't think Anthony Barr is going to make that big of a difference. Zimmer uses him completely wrong. You know, if you had him in as like, what, a stand up outside linebacker and just let him pin his ears back and just rush. Mm-hmm. Think of how much pressure we could generate, especially last year when our leading sack, or our leading sack was in got uh, What's his name? You need Ngakwe. Ngakwe. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Sorry, words are hard sometimes. Yeah. And he was only on the team, what, five, six games, and we traded him away. You got to generate pressure. You got to right. help those cornerbacks. That's one of the reasons why they were so bad last year, for lack of a better word, is they had no pressure. What did you think, too, about the defensive line? Just like, you know, I, I think I think that's finally fixed, and especially if Daniil's happy and good to go, like, I know last year when they lost to Neil Hunter, I still kind of thought, well, they'll be able to still figure out ways to get after the quarterback, and they were one of the worst teams, and that's why they made the Ngakwe trade, only then to punt on it basically five, six weeks in. I feel like of all the position groups that the defensive line is probably the one that the Vikings are solidified, and they should be good going into 2021. I agree with you if Hunter's back. If Hunter's unhappy with his deal for whatever, well, I shouldn't say for whatever reason, he's highly underpaid. There's no getting around that. But if we can get him back, use some of that money we got from the post-June 1st cut of Rudolph, turn that into a signing bonus for an extension or whatever, get Hunter back, I think we have probably one of the best, if not the best, front four in the league. Yeah, you know, the Daniel Hunter situation is just kind of so interesting because he's extremely underpaid. He kind of made a fuss about his contract, too, after the next surgery. You know, he delayed the next surgery. It's definitely, I don't think it's on thin ice as it was maybe when we first thought this was coming down you know, midway through the season when he first got the surgery and there was a tweak and then it turned into this, you know, drama. But at the same time, I, I, the, the number one priority, you know, you and I were just kicking around, hey, should they sign a depth cornerback or a depth wide receiver? The Probably the, the biggest remaining offseason checklist is keeping Daniil Hunter healthy. Like those pass rushers at that age are hard to find. And I know he's coming off significant surgery, but he's basically going to be the linchpin that gets after the quarterback. Like you need Daniil Hunter probably more than anyone else on the defense. Oh, absolutely. You know, last year without him, just look how bad our front four was. If you don't have somebody at least half as good as Hunter, because I'm not completely sold on Shamar Stefan. Mm-hmm. I think he's a good rotational guy. I don't know if he's your main guy you want there. For sure. And you can't count on your nose tackles, your three tacks, whatever, generating pressure every down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Mike Zimmer, I had a little bit of an eye-opening experience for me because I just figured even though they lost Neil Hunter that they'll still be – pretty solid and getting after the quarterback he's he's still a, a defensive guru but then you kind of figured out how important a, a legitimate pass rush is for the minnesota vikings and historically speaking at least in our lifetimes you know they, they've had very very good pass rushers all going all the way back to kevin williams and pat williams from when i was a younger kid and they've always figured out ways to get after the quarterback where last year um that was not the case at all yeah you need you need to know hunter to eat man you absolutely do uh, let, let, let's go over the Viking schedule here, Garrett, because I, I know uh, you were excited to talk about win totals here, and the NFL schedule came out just a couple weeks ago, and we know who the Vikings finally will be playing this year. You and I talked about earlier that they finally get a home game against the Seahawks. That'll be their first one, um, first home game in week three. They start on the road back-to-back. What does your gut tell you? What's, what's your instant reaction? How many wins do you see on this Viking schedule? See, for me, it all depends on Ro- if Rodgers is on the Packers. If he's not... Mm-hmm. Hands down, win the division, 12 and 5. Hate the new play or hate the new structure. I hate it. I hate the odd numbers. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah. But if Rodgers is gone, like you guys have been saying, no excuses. You need to win the division. If you don't win the division with Rodgers gone, everybody should be gone. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I think uh, in general, if, if he's not playing, like, I, I, I can't see a situation where the Vikings aren't the favorite going into the going into the division. Like, if Rodgers is indeed gone, it's Blake Portals or Jordan Love. You know, the Vikings should absolutely uh, roll through the division. What about Chicago? Do you think even though they get Justin Fields, do you still feel like they can probably still threat for the division? Uh, Yes and no. Their defense has always been really good against Minnesota. But, you know, Jordan Love doesn't – or I'm sorry, not Jordan Love. Justin Fields doesn't really scare me rookie year. Could he be dynamic and stuff? Absolutely. But I think he needs a year or two to really, really, you know, Mm -hmm. scare you, if that makes sense. And I think, like, even though the Vikings have, I believe, according to opponent winning percentage, you know, they have a very tough schedule. I believe it's the fifth hardest in the NFL. It kind of looks like the way it shakes out that it's actually pretty favorable. There isn't, like, a tough stretch. Last year, you know, when you had to go to Tampa Bay and New Orleans, like, that was a gauntlet. It, it basically cost you the season. I know you lost it at home to the Bears, too. That played in the factor there. But in general, there isn't, like, a, a tough 
portion on this schedule. So even though the opponents last year were pretty dang good, I think the Vikings kind of lucked out with how it laid out. Oh, absolutely, especially after that what was it, one and five start, one and six start, where Kirk, you know, you could have had anybody back there and it would have been better than Kirk, at least that mm-hmm. stretch. And then he, after the bye, came back. It's really started killing it. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, he absolutely stepped back up after a disastrous start, and they needed him to because, my God, yeah, that was – you can put the majority of those, that one and five start, completely on him. He was he was abysmal. Uh, you know what? We got an extra guest here. We got our guy Ryan who just popped into the screen. There we Ryan, go. what's there going we go. on, man? You got us okay? Yeah, how's it going, man? Good, man. How are you? Good, man. I, I watch you guys' show just about every day. Uh, Love it. Thank you. Maybe not live, but uh, I, I definitely get on here quite a bit. Uh, trying to catch up and, and keep up to current matters. You know, I'm not I'm not a football guru, but I do love the Vikings. How long have you been a Vikings fan for? Man, since I could, since I knew how to watch football, since That's I knew right. what football was. I mean, there was a, there was a short period of time back when you know Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, and all those guys were on the Cowboys. Where I, I really liked the Cowboys, but then I, I realized how dumb that was. <laughs> and 